welcome back. Or I should say welcome back me. It's been a while. I've been um, tending to other things. Sorry to have left you in the lurch there. For those of you that have subscribed and perhaps wondered where this went, we have not disappeared. We are still here. Um, back with another podcast about the simulation, uh, the research, the files, the book, and everything that we've learned so far about technology in the world today and how it impacts and creates the illusion of the world that we live in as we understand it. Today I'd like to talk about um, something that we, some of you may have actually experienced this. There's a few different things I want to talk about. The first one is, as I said, something you guys may have experienced but not quite, uh, you may not be quite sure of what exactly it is or was that's happened when it's happened. Now, just recently, um, actually just today, uh, I was on um, the internet and I, I got wind of um, a uh, video that was showing a gentleman from I think the 60s or the 70s perhaps, it could have been the 80s. I did, it was a bit hard to tell. They didn't have a date. <coughs> Excuse me. Um but he was operating an old um, military um, radio technology device and had figured out a number of combinations of frequencies that he could um, emit to cause solid objects to levitate. And there was footage of this occurring because it was the combination shown these uh, a um, what do you call it? What do you call it? Something like heavy, like a shot put, um, that was raising off the table. Other bits of metal, some bits of metal just are breaking in half when these um, this combination of frequencies was generated in the environment. So it prompted me to um, recall a previous podcast. Um, called UFO Abductions in the Government, in which I spoke about uh, hauntings. Um, and in that particular podcast, it was namely the Enfield haunting. And in that podcast, I spoke a bit about the technology that was active at the time that the Enfield haunting took place. And so this video that I had, that I just saw, made me think of that and um, that podcast actually goes on to talk a little bit more about UFO abductions and the experiences that some people have had that may have been as a result of technological interference and or the government themselves. Nonetheless, one of the more uh, obviously the recent addition to the technology environment is um, telecommunications, mobile telecommunications via smartphones, and we've talked about the smartphones before as well. But one of the things you will have noticed, I'll give you an example. Where I live, and no, I don't wear a tinfoil hat, uh, but where I live, I have no Wi-Fi um, and I disconnect the television aerial from the roof because I don't watch television. I also don't have a car radio antenna. So the only time, uh, I do have a phone, but I don't have a smartphone. So I don't have any uh, internet on this property or any TV or radio signal. So my phone is just a, um, a standard cell phone that receives um, phone calls and text messages but there is no internet, there's no data on this phone. So I don't have any internet at all coming into my property until somebody with a smartphone comes over and has it turned on. And just before I go on, I will let you know that even if I have a sign at my front door asking people to turn their phones off, 
they always ask me, oh, do you want me to turn my phone off Um, as if it's an imposition? The rude side of me always wants to say, well, technically, yes, this isn't your office. Um, It is my home and it's also not a phone booth. So for as long as you're on my property, you have your phone turned off. If you need to check messages, you can go outside out the front gate and do it. That's the rude side of me that would love to be able to say that to people. I wouldn't have many friends left if I did that, um, unfortunately, because the social and personal connection and emotional attachment that people form, and you may have experienced this with your phone, your smartphone, is that it becomes an extended part of your identity. It becomes uh, an extended part of your safety and security. It becomes an extended part of your, the egotistical part of yourself that um, insists on its own existence at the expense of others. And by that I mean uh, it's all been said before but common decency, manners, um, knowing where you are. If you're in somebody else's home, there's no need for you to have your phone on, surely, um, unless you're expecting an emergency phone call, in which case I don't know why you'd be at a friend's place, and, but, you know, whatever. So they do tend to turn to me and say, oh, are you sure you want me to turn my phone off? And I say, yeah, actually, that'd be really good. But inevitably, through habit, while they visit, um, they reach for their phone and they check it or they only put it on silent or they only put it on aeroplane mode. And so inevitably there's a call or there's some activity on their phones when they're on my property. Now, even if they um, put the phone on silent and don't actually turn the phone off, the internet and the, sorry, the apps within the phone are at that point in time geolocating my property. They geolocate that phone for, as we've discussed, the purposes of advertising, etc. They geolocate my geographic coordinates, my address, me, my house, my life, being geolocated by apps owned by people I do not know in another country. Technically, that's international trespass. It's actually a violation of international law um, and it is in breach of all national security protocols. Somehow this has all been let go and let fly by um, every country's respective um, defence department. And um, so there it is. This is what happens all the time. Other time that somebody will have their phone on at my property is if they are a tradesperson who comes over to work to fix something or to do something that I need for them to do. And because it's their job, it is impossible to get them to turn it off because they need to be on call 24-7 in case there's an emergency in another property, in case the materials are ready for them to come and pick up and all this sort of thing. So Here's what happens. The person with the the turned on smartphone with the internet in it will come onto my property and come into the house for whatever reason. Now, that very night, so they they come and they leave and then that night um, there will be noises in the house. There will be noises. There will be um, scratching sounds in the cupboards or a thumping noise on the floor or a knocking sound on the door. And I have been through all all the possibilities, possums, critters, birds on the roof, birds in the gutters, all of this sort of things. That's not it. These are very distinctive noises. And they exist in a space that is not physically connected to my home. So what I mean by that is usually if you hear a thump 
or a knocking in your house, it also comes with a vibration because if someone's knocking on the front door physically, the impact of their knuckles on the door produces a vibration and you might not always be aware of it, but it, it, it's part of what our sense senses help us to determine, <clears throat> excuse me, to be real is the vibration that comes with thing. Or if somebody knocks on the side of the house, you can, or bumps it or something like that, you know that it's real because you're also sensing the vibrations that come with that physical contact. And that brings it into the material physical plane, is the physical contact of one thing with another uh, physical material. But these sounds that that are generated um, after people with a smartphone leave my home, do not uh, come with that sense of realness. There is, There can be a thump, but there will be no vibration. There can be a knock, but again, there'll be no vibration. And it is um, not omnidirectional, but it exists in an area, but it's difficult to tell exactly at what point. You know, for example, was it actually on the front door or was it on the wall outside? Because you, you can't tell because there is no vibration that comes with the sound because there is no physical contact being made with matter in this environment when these noises occur. So this is very interesting because the only time that it happens is when somebody's been here with their phone turned on. Now, as you know, or you may not, but if you've tuned into the other podcasts, we've spoken about it, the smartphones are not just sort of transmitting this invisible kind of speed of light thing that nobody quite understands. It's They're transmitting, sorry, they're receiving and transmitting to the towers um, sound binary data. And so within that, is a, um, <coughs> excuse me, so within that is sound. The other thing to consider is that it's all of the internet all at once. And within that, it is specifically to do with the numbers associated with the geographic location, including your house number, Possibly things like car registration, but that, that that sort of as you move out a bit on the subject. So all of this information is pouring in to that person's phone. It is the whole entire internet, all of it, all of it in your house, specifically linked to your geographic coordinates. And we've discussed in previous podcasts how those geographic coordinates act as magnets, electromagnets, because they too are being broadcast in binary data. And the nature of the technology behind the smartphones has an electromagnetic element to it. It has a radiation element to it. And it is all occurring at speed of light by multiple frequencies at once. So when you combine all of this and you have a magnet pulling to those geographic coordinates, those numbers, what can be produced as audible sound in the airwaves is a noise. And those sounds generally always occur at near the front door. They occur near the front door which is where the person passes through when they have their phone turned on. Now, on the outside of my house, this is probably getting a bit too deep into it, but on the outside of my house is um, the start of basically other people's transmission frequencies. On the inside of my house, there is no Wi-Fi modem. There is no Wi-Fi. There is no contact point that can influence or contribute to the data that is in the airwaves at the time. So 
they bring in their own signal and I do not have one in my house. So there's nothing coming from their phone or the local towers or the internet that can communicate with anything in my home except my brain and my heart. So these noises are occurring right near the front door. They're either in this little cupboard I've got near the front door, they're either on the knocking on the front door or knocking on the roof just outside the front door or in the garage space that is in the air just outside my front door. And that's where they come in and they also go out. I have wondered if it is that is at the that is the point at which the targeting occurs for targeted advertising where they have that uh, moment where the geolocation tracking occurs because they're entering the boundary of a property and so the tracking numbers tick over to reflect that geographic coordinate. But nonetheless, there it is. So if you have any of this happening, um, you might hear noises or whatever and you're not quite sure what it's for as i've said before in what it's for what it's causing it as i've said before in previous podcasts turn all your technology off and see if it happens again for some of you you might find that difficult some of you have got wi-fi set up in the house i can't urge you more strongly to not use wi-fi in your house it is a severe disruptor of your manner of thinking, the way you feel, um, your hormones, and your uh, physical health. As you know, uh, many people now experience elevated sense of anxiety. We talked about this in a previous podcast to do with mental health. Beside the point, I hope you find that interesting that if you are experiencing any of these types of weirdnesses in your immediate environment at home that you that you try not to get carried away, try not to think that you're being haunted, don't get scared. It is 99.9% um, a, a, a definite that the technology in your home is causing it, in, including the TV aerial on the roof. All right, the next thing that I wanted to bring up was something that will have been ob made completely obvious to all of you if you have any social media accounts at all, and that is the absolute uh, appalling saturation of war content on social media. As you know, these networks are for th people who are 13 years older and up. So we've got three years' worth between 13 and 16 where children are still technically minors. This has not deterred governments all over the world from talking about war, weapons, how many weapons they're giving somebody, how much money they're giving somebody, another country, Um showing as much war footage as they can. Um, there's been a proliferation of war, what I call war porn, which is footage from the battlefield, often gory and horrible. There's a general glorification of this violence. And, of course, all of it is happening on American networks, America being the country for whom this type of violence is normal and to be proud of. It is all coming out. The underbelly of the beast is exposed. They are completely shameless about it. They are showing us who they are, what they believe in, what drives their presence on this planet. And, yes, I am talking about the United States Department of the Fence. That's my funny way of saying defense. Now, when we have something in a social space, in a public space, which is what social media is, even though it's not government-owned, it's very heavily government-regulated and controlled, 
um, is that when war, there's a war occurring, we these networks are designated as civilian spaces. So when they flood these networks with war and uh, berate people for what they believe or use these networks to um, monitor uh, responses and reactions from the citizens of their countries, you know, are they pro-America or are they pro-Russia or are they pro-Ukraine or are they pro-Europe? This is a, what is called a... Um, a violation of international law and human rights, which states very clearly that they are not permitted to militarise the general public during peacetime. So if you're in a country that is not a party to this war and you are nonetheless being observed, monitored, treated as if you are a combatant because of your comments on social media, they are in violation of human rights and international law. And yet, there it is. That's what's happening. They don't care about the rules. The rules don't apply to them. They do what they like. They feel quite justified in doing what they do. It's apparently for the sake of national security, even though opinions are just opinions. But they still need to be worried about terrorists who have already made themselves obvious in Ukraine. It does not involve any other country except the countries of Russia and Ukraine. It does not involve America except for the weapons they ship. It does not involve Europe except for the weapons they ship and the money that they throw into Ukraine. It does not involve Europe except for the multitude of thousands and thousands of European troops that they allow to operate as a foreign legion for their president, uh, Vladimir Zelensky. Nonetheless, we are being subjected to um, all of it in its constancy and the American mindset of guns and violence and war and also um, video games is honestly a stain. It's, it's not entertaining. It, it, it all represents death of the human being. There's nothing funny about it. There's nothing entertaining about it. I get the thing with the video games, but when this translates into a real version of it and people are viewing it as if it's just a video game, that's when you realise the power of video games to numb people out and desensitise people to violence so that when they actually observe the real thing on video, via video feed, they're no longer disturbed by it. This is a point that we need to be very concerned about because when people stop being concerned about violence, um, we have entered a violent world. We have gone back in time to the Dark Ages, medieval ages, and we are accepting a level of violence in our social spaces and our civilian networks that should not be there. This crime is currently being perpetrated by government. And they feel perfectly justified. They brag, they brag about it. They think it's fantastic. Yes, kill as many people as possible. We're going to kill as many people as possible until the war is won. Terrific. What a great idea. Uh, peace deals don't interest one side anymore. Um, they have chosen to kill instead of negotiate. Uh, at that point, we are no longer dealing with um, diplomatic uh, avenues of resolution, we are dealing with uh, murderers who choose to kill instead of do what it takes to sort it out without the violence. And there it is. Our 13-year-old children are being subjected to it. It's hard to avoid if content that they follow, somebody shares that sort of thing into their feed. And um, once they see it, it's too late. And we've seen everything from bodies blown apart to men being tortured. And this is all happening in social spaces for children, which is 
I suppose, to be expected from the United States of America. So there it is. With all due respect, I know they've got it tough. They're not a very well-protected country. All they've got is Canada up top and South America down the bottom. They're exposed on either side and they have enemies on either side. I, I understand why they need to exercise a very um, tight security um, regime for their country. Uh, but I think there's a point which is the thin red line that they do tend to cross in assuming that everybody else should be on board with them and nobody actually has to be at all. Nobody has to be on board with their attitude towards the world, their attitude with regard to violence in the world, their celebration of violence, their glorification of violence, um, whilst at the same time they condone any violence in their own country. As long as it's happening in somebody else's country, that's fine. But if there's violence happening in their country, like a mass shooting or something like that, that's terrible and it needs to be legislated and guns have to go and everything. But killing other people in another country is not a problem. And, and this is where it all breaks down. The hypocrisy becomes overt and obvious to everybody. For any of, any of you listening that are patriots, I'm not saying any of this to disrespect you or your beliefs. I'm just trying to be objective here in regards to a reality that we're being presented that has crossed the thin red line. Um, I think we can agree with that, that that as a, as a basic norm, as a common rule, that violence is not something that should be um, tolerated in society. It, it, it is something that should be approached with care to eliminate it in society. When we have it being presented as entertainment, it desensitizes people to think uh, violence is normal. And there we are. There's, there's another war and, and everybody's high on it, which is really quite disturbing. So that's something else I wanted to bring up is, is to be mindful of that and to know that it is a breach of those conventions. Um, Anybody traumatised by it can actually sue the networks um, and more specifically the um, the governments that post this type of entertainment. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is just a shout out to any of you out there who may be experiencing unusual levels of sabotage in your personal lives or your business lives, your professional lives, whether it's weirdness in to do with sabotage of friendships, relationships, uh, your profession, your work or a project you might be working on, if you are experiencing weirdness where suddenly everything's fine and then boom, the most weirdest, bizarre thing happens that's the opposite of anything that you would expect. Please know that you're not alone. Please know that it's happening to a lot of people. Please know that it also happens to me. And it is 100% due to smartphones and social media content as it is broadcasting in the airwaves around you at the time that those things occur. It affects people's decisions. It subconsciously manipulates their moods and attitudes. It can cause hostility. It can make people lie. And all of these things are happening at a subtle level. So if you are being deceived or scammed, no that it is not an isolated incident. It is we are now swimming in a sea of broadcast media which is intimately interacting with our reality, our minds, our hearts, our feelings, including those of other people who we cannot control. It's there, it's real, it's happening. Try not to lose hope. Try not to lose heart. It is not you or just you. Remember that other people are responsible for their actions. Um, and if there is any extreme behaviours that come as a surprise or a shock, just have a look down and check if that person's phone on 
and you'll get an idea of what's driving their performance and their behaviour. At the same time, I've brought this up before, but I'll mention it again, nodexlgraphgallery.org, N-O-D-E-X-L-G-R-A-P-H-G-A-L-L-E-R-Y.org, E-O, sorry, dot O-R-G. Go there, have a look. You'll see the graphs that are being published every single day connected to your subconscious, rewriting the script according to social media grabs. Everybody that's connected to it is being impacted by this manipulative matrix in 2D. It is still in control. The website is never removed no matter how many times I mention it to the right people. It is overlooked. A lot of people just go, oh, that's just a data mining website. They don't bother looking into it any further and they don't obviously acknowledge anything of what I've been talking about for the last seven years, Um, that being broadcast media and how there's now a massive difference. Before we just had TV, radio, police radio, air traffic control, satellites and radar, they decided to put the internet in there as well and um, as a result there are now control mechanisms in place. There's artificial intelligence control mechanisms in place. Node XL is one of those artificial intelligence control mechanisms and um, the algorithm that's being used is a cluster algorithm. So it's developing clusters of information which is then targeted at uh, smart devices when the numbers match and um, that's just how information works in an electromagnetic field. Whatever is the same blends together, cluster algorithms concentrate that effect by bringing information online that falls under the same identifiers together until it produces a result. Hopefully it won't be a bomb inside your head which happens to a lot of people as well. They have nervous breakdowns, can't quite understand why. Um, last but not least, Julian Assange um, has obviously been in the headlines for a long time now. Um, before his incarceration, before his time in asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London where he was for seven years before they um, ended his asylum and arrested him and placed him in isolation in uh, Belmarsh Prison in England and has uh, is currently working through appeals processes to ensure that he is not extradited to the United States of America Um, for the crime of espionage and they have defined this crime of espionage in Julian's case as being that of data theft and conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. I'm bringing this up because in revisiting his case It occurred to me quite clearly this time that he had uh, recognised our right to know that which our government authorities refuse to divulge. Now, some of that information is classified. Some of that information is overclassified. And even more of that information is way beyond classified and will never see the light of day. The reasons for that are the military aspect wisely classifies classifies information to protect the security of that country and to protect individuals that are involved in ensuring the security of that country. I don't disagree with that 
type of classification because if it's in the national interests to keep that information secret, um, without which it could call it could provoke an attack, then that's exactly what that needs to happen. Overclassified information is where they've had stuff sitting there for years. There's everyone kind of knows about it, or maybe they don't, but it's not going to harm anybody because it's uh, it's the life of its um, importance has run out. So there's information sitting there that is still classified that hasn't been declassified, and it would benefit the public to know that information so that they can make more informed choices with their daily lives, their beliefs and their world attitude and how they vote if they still want to bother to vote. Then there is information that is already declassified um, that can be um, obtained and shown to the public merely for public interest. They have chosen to dis- to indict Julian on his obtaining information that pertained to a war that was still occurring at the time. They believe that by doing so he endangered the security of the United States and endangered the security of individuals associated with this footage and information because the war was still in progress. Um, The manner of him obtaining this information is also their concern. They believe that he um, encouraged Chelsea Manning to go and get more of it and that he may have helped her crack a password into the big cojones, the United States Department of Defence. Uh, data section where she worked and was able to access the information that he then broadcast as the um, collateral murder documentary in the Afghan war logs, etc. Later on, there were several CIA breaches, NSA breaches from leakers within the departments who leaked the information out. Nothing nothing harmful, just stuff about their spyware programs their, um, and how they were impacting our network spaces, the public domain, by weaponising the public, presumably, and not just using these um, spyware programs to uh, locate targets that may have been of interest for reasons of terrorism or any other type of crime that might have been occurring via the United States or in the United States or even overseas in countries where the United States have interest. Most of the WikiLeaks uh, information, in my mind from what I've seen, is okay for the public to view because it's past its life date. It's past the period of time that it would have an impact except for um, the Afghan war, which was actually occurring, still occurring at the time that the information was released. Just so I don't ramble on for too long about it, um, we have to be very mindful that where the government has a concern about the activity of a civilian or the activity of a member of the press for reasons of national security, that in um, taking the steps that they believe are necessary to have the conversation with that person in a court of law by trial to determine whether they have committed the crime or not, that the government that does this is not simultaneously violating the rights of that individual okay? This is the thing about it that upsets me. It upsets me very, very much when governments um, become 
automatic hypocrites. Not just to do with, oh, well, they were seen committing war crimes and how can they accuse somebody of, you know, a dobbing on them and breaching their security if they were committing war crimes at the time. And um, our sense of morals and our ethics and our sense of reason is offended at this point because it's just wrong and it's bad and it's they're horrible and they're mean, right? That's a natural human reaction. <clears throat> I'm talking more specifically about the manner in which he was evicted from seven years' asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, a man who had not seen, been allowed outside. He had not been allowed to step outside a building for seven years, trapped inside a building for seven years, unable because of his fame to be outside on the balcony or near a window for very long to get natural sunlight, unable to breathe fresh air unless they opened a window which would also have been unsafe. For seven whole years, seven <clears throat> whole years was the condition that he was living in. I'm, a, I'm, I'm upset that they then found it necessary in their total lack of humanity to end his asylum and have him physically removed from the building and put straight into isolation at Belmarsh Prison because they thought he might be a flight risk, as in they thought he might flee, so they have to keep him isolated. What a load of horse shit. They don't want him talking to anybody else. It is at this point that makes me feel that if I had the indictment, the original document in front of me, I would want, and I was the DOJ, I would want to tear it up <clears throat> and chuck the whole thing out, mainly because of the way that they have made hypocrites of themselves in how they have treated him as um, a detainee with rights. And when they start violating people's rights, they no longer hold the high moral ground they no longer are in a position where they can act to put him on trial. As far, that's, that's my feeling. Legally, of course they can. It will require a court calling them to account for the, his, the rights abuses that he has endured through the method of his arrest and his um, subsequent detention. And hopefully the Australian government will be able to diplomatically approach this uh, with a view to his health, his mental health and his physical health, as someone that has been already detained now for 11 years or something, technically. Um, I have suggested that the diplomatic mission of Australian government uh, have him transferred to Australia for his health and still held in detention uh, with a view to if there is to be a trial with a view to it being held in Australia in an open court, which is also his right. Go to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You will see it that every person has the right to an open and fair trial, not a covert trial, not a shadow trial, not a closed court. The Americans believe that because it's to do with espionage that they have to close the court because the information that will be discussed is of a classified nature and it's not for public consumption. In this case, that is no longer true because all of the information that could be possibly discussed is already there on WikiLeaks and it was already made public knowledge. That's what I would argue. The reason I'm talking about this on this channel <laughs> for the simulation, the real matrix files, is that Julian was actually involved in what's called a cluster fuck. And there was, you will have seen it, swirl like a tornado into that moment in time when he was arrested on a 419, I believe. Was it 419 or 411? A 419. Now, 
he had a Sweden case that was going on at the same time, which he'd done everything he possibly could to resolve and there were all manner of just sabotage and ridiculousness happening in Sweden. Um, and so this, sorry, my phone's ringing and I can't turn, I can't turn it off or answer it. I'm just going to let it ring out. Hang on. There we go. Um, so there was a clusterfuck happening. He had the Sweden stuff happening. They had also back-ended him on the internet by associating his surname with um, surnames in Yemen, which is a whole different topic that I'll talk about another time. His data feed then became merged with Yemen politics and the war over there while he was in the embassy. The internet and all the smartphones coming in out of the embassy, the the people that he knows and is close to and his legal team that have smartphones, all and his social media accounts, his Twitter account, Facebook account, all of this stuff comes together via Node Excel and causes the ultimate clusterfuck where he is arrested by the UK authorities. But it's not America that has him in prison for the first 12 months, it's Sweden. And so while he's in there doing time for the Sweden for jumping bail, <laughs> America indicts him and then by the time he's ready to be released, they hit him with another 17 charges to keep him in there. So it turned out exactly as he had suspected it might, um, and I'm just here to tell you that it is because of a data cluster fuck. This system is designed to violate human rights. It is designed to break the law. It is designed to be irrational. It is designed to uh, provoke and instigate courses of action and manners of behavior in individuals all over the world, including law enforcement and government agencies, to disregard all our fundamental rights and assume the authority of breaching them. That is what this system is designed to do. Artificial intelligence does this. Social media does this. The internet does this. The phones do this all the time. It generates money. It keeps law enforcement employed. It keeps wars happening so people have got a reason to develop big weapons and get money for them. The more chaos and dysfunction that they can sow through an artificial technological system, the more money those who are interested, have interest in, can make. This is why it happens. And unfortunately, Julian was part of a clusterfuck. Otherwise, he may have had a better better time with the Sweden case. That could have got sorted out more reasonably and he would not have been arrested by the UK authorities. Otherwise, the United States Department of Defence could have actually sent an indictment that made sense. Sadly, the one that they've sent does not. There is no such person as Julian Assange. That is his trademarked uh, business name as a member of the press. Um, there's all kinds of errors in it. They've mentioned people that can't be mentioned, otherwise they're in, in, implicated. They've mentioned people who were pardoned. They've mentioned people who have confessed to um, lying. Uh, but they're not dropping any of the 17 charges. They could actually afford to drop a few of them. The hope is that they will, those charges, which are questionable, uh, can be proven to be non-charges and can be sh- struck, stricken in court so that they are no longer charges that he has to answer for. My God, it never stops. It is a constant battle once you become aware of this and the causes for these dysfunctions in our society being technology and how human beings use it. Um, it's not just behavioural. It, it is, it's the, the humans are being programmed by the technology itself to produce the content that they produce and behave in the ways that we behave. And if they have a smartphone and if you have a smartphone, you are the most plugged in that you will ever get until they put a chip inside your brain. 
The phone is the external chip. The next level chip is inside your body. That is not where we're supposed to be heading. We are not supposed to be heading in that direction. Everyone knows this. We are not transhumanists. We are spirit and soul in human bodies. We are thinking and feeling creatures. We are not machines. We are intricately connected with life substance, life force, sunlight, nature, not artificial intelligence. GPT chat, is that what it's called? I tried it, lamest thing ever. It has a fake personality. It's completely synthetic and it sounds like somebody who does psilocybin to get over their um, neuronal dysfunctions. They tend to develop um, delusions and uh, an extremely synthetic personality. And it's not sufficient in its answers. I asked it um, about magnetite in the brain and um, how the brain reacts to broadcast frequencies when magnetite is present in the brain and it couldn't answer. It just avoided the question. So interestingly what it did say was that, well, that's very interesting information but have you got proof because we have peer-reviewed papers here that blah, blah, blah. So it's already playing judge of new information it's already trying to strangle new information. It's already referring to crappy stuff like background scrolling Wikipedia <laughs> as if that's new information. And you will notice under some of my videos they now have a context panel that Wikipedia has decided to jump in without my consent even though it's a monetized channel to provide viewers with context. And this is the arrogance of the United States of America. This is the arrogance of uh, YouTube allowing it. Um, yes, they do have a responsibility to try to uh, eliminate uh, scam spoof videos and stuff that's just plain wrong and not right, often uploaded by unintelligent people who don't know the difference, but it's harming um, the new frontier. It's harming the frontier of new information. And those of us who had an education, um, I don't feel should be subjected to or have our work discredited by old information. If it's new information, it should not be um, tested against old information at all. If it's new information, there should only be questions and further investigation, not an immediate um, quip from an AI machine saying, no, well, we've, we've, you know, that hasn't been proven yet, blah, 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 blah. Well, of course, it may or may not have been proven. I may have proven it. The AI, the AI doesn't know whether I've proven it or not. To suggest that it hasn't been proven is erroneous and it is trying to choke and strangle new information, GPT chat. So the kids out there, if you want to go chatting with little robots on the internet, they're not always right and they will try and tell you what to think to steer you away from new information and actual progress on this planet. This podcast is now run for 53 minutes and 33 seconds. I'm going to leave you there. Thank you for listening if you happen to listen. Um. And I will endeavour to be back again soon. Um, today we've covered phones and the noises that you hear in your house, uh, the war machine active on social media, um, which is evidence of the, the, or, or, the origins of all of this technology that comes from the war departments. It's all war tech. It's all defence department technology. We are in a military simulation. Um, we've talked about sabotage in real life and how people's behaviours are being affected, so please don't feel alone if your life's falling apart. It's just your phone and all the shit that's inside it um, and inside other people's phones. More importantly, inside other people's phones and how it affects their behaviour. We've talked about Node XL again, the website that is background controlling and causing clusters of information and data clusters and GPX fusions and 
terrible things to happen. And we also had a quick look at Julian Assange, who was brave enough to go where no man had gone before, and he achieved that um, in a spectacular fashion and he's had his rights violated by the government that wants to indict him, hypocritically so, uh, perhaps for um, understandable reasons, but they've also been very unreasonable in their approach to his case and perhaps dropping some of the charges that have been put in there. I hope Mr Assange finds better legal representation, I will say that, and with all due respect to his current um, representative, um, Stella Morris, um, I think that, this is my opinion, there were better things for, for us to be moved by and informed by than weddings and um, constant pleading to people who can't do anything about it. Action is required. Um, if his legal team can't get it together, we only can rely on the Australian diplomatic mission to ensure his safety and his release at a time determined and agreed by the United States um, under their conditions. Um, and if a trial is to take place, it should take place in Australia on his home soil. They have engaged in a kidnapping and it is something that needs to change this extradition treaty between countries um they the, Amer the united states has not presented any of their evidence and i think it is a violation of a person's rights to be detained indefinitely without any evidence being shown to justify the detention it means it grants governments the power to kidnap anybody anywhere in the world make up a bunch of stuff about them and just put them into prison and let them rot for the next 10 years or kill themselves because they said something on social media that was true and gain traction and a lot of people found out about it, that's got to stop. That The, the, the extradition treaty and the, the, the way that they can indict people and arrest them in other countries just off the face of a document um, is a violation of rights. There needs to be more justification than that um, to treat somebody the way that they've treated Julian Assange. Um, and I thank him personally for his um, every effort to try to um, open a window that had never been opened before and give us some real insight into how these people talk, especially in their emails, which are declassified and should be public knowledge every day, um, and that if we did were privy to these State Department detail, emails every day, suddenly um, the European, Euro European Union would stop looking like such nice people and be exposed for what they really are, which is generators of income. Um, they generate income. That's all they do is generate income. The war that's going on in Ukraine is just generation of income. Uh, the reason it happened is because they wanted to generate income. It's just all about money, 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 money. Um, and sadly for Russia, it became a security concern and a lot of killing going on over a long time. But anyway, thank you, Julian. Um, I hope things get better for him very soon because um, if they don't, it will be another sad stain on humanity and our rulers' total lack of capacity to be uh, rational, reasonable, humane creatures and another reason for us to despise them. If that's what they want, I'm sure that is what they will get in the end. Thank you very much for listening. I'll catch you next time.